Hello and welcome from Buenos Aires, Argentina, to this episode of Crossing Borders with Nathan Lustig, where Nita's conversations with entrepreneurs doing business across borders and the people who support them, with a focus on those that have some connection to Latin America. My name is Josefina Dominguez, and I am an editor for Latinlist, a proud sponsor of the Crossing Borders podcast. Sign up for our weekly updates on latinlist.com to get a summary of the week's biggest headlines in Latin American tech news. Nate's guest today is Pete Flint, the managing partner at NFX, a seed stage venture fund that focuses on network effect businesses. Pete also founded and was the former CEO at Trulia and formed part of the board of directors for Zillow Group. They talk about why Pete and his team decided to make the jump into Latin America as investors and what he's most excited about in the region. Pete also provides advice to founders for overcoming crises, having himself experienced running a company during September 11 and the 2008 crisis. We hope you enjoy this conversation with Pete Flint. Hey Pete, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thanks Nathan. Great to uh, great to be here today. So where are you in the world today? I am in San Francisco in a uh, home office here in uh, at the moment sunny san francisco one of the last vcs who hasn't left apparently <laughs> <laughs> last man standing oh, i i can assure you the the talk of kind of san francisco um exodus is very limited i think there's um there's definitely um a uh you know there's definitely some kind of reduction in people here but i you know i, I think a lot of it it's, it's different. I think a lot of it is like people that can are using it as an opportunity to explore different parts of the world. But um, I've actually seen um, people starting to come back now, not in the offices so much, but just like, OK, that was awesome. I spent <laughs> like uh, six, nine months in, you know, a month there, a month there. And now they're kind of like, OK. Yeah, ready to get back to it. So uh, we did a more in-depth uh, podcast with your partner, James before where we went pretty deep on, on NFX, but give us for the listeners who haven't listened to that one yet, give us the little overview of uh, what you're doing and what you invest in. Sure, so NFX, uh, we're a early stage fund that focuses really leading seed rounds. So we do some pre-seed and seed and, and a tiny bit of A, but generally it's like, it's focused on being the first um, and, we aspire to be the most important um, investor for the companies that we work with. So we do that. Um, you know, certainly, you know, historically we've been US focused. Um, we have a team in Israel and we've done more and more in LATAM uh, over the last few years. So excited to dig into that. And where where are you from originally? So I was born, uh, I was born in the UK. Um, so, you know, maybe just kind of my journey is is I spent probably the first little bit over the first half of my life in in the UK. So um, ended up you know undergrad was in a master's in physics, um, and then uh, and then I got very in, early on into the internet world. So I took a bunch of internships while I was at university in different companies, and you know I was always interested in tech. Um, and so I, you know, I guess one of the formative years was I, I um, was trying to figure out what to do. And, you know, a lot of my friends went into investment banking after kind of undergrad. undergrad. So, and uh, so I got a job at JP Morgan, partly just to see what it was like, and then partly because they paid the most money and I wanted to kind of fund my, uh, my you know, my education. Um, and so I, you know, it was, and it was the summer when Netscape went public, the first internet browser went public. And, and in sort of in the kind of history books, this was really the starting line for the internet revolution. And uh, I realized two things. One is I really didn't want to become an investment banker. Um, and two, I, I very quickly, I, I, I became sort of, you know, a, at the time, a, a, an expert on the internet. I just spent, you know, three months getting deep, deep, deep into it, was very small. And then said, okay, from that point on, I want to get involved in internet startups. Um, and sort of found my path. Firstly, as part of the founding team, a company called lastminute.com, 
which was a very big European Web 1.0 company that went public in 2000 um, and then ultimately sold for a billion dollars, um, more than a billion dollars um, in 2003. Um, and then after that, that, I mean, that was an epic experience. And then after that, I moved to, you know, I, you know, when you're growing up in, in London, you always have your sights set on Silicon Valley, like, um, you know, the, um, the great companies that were built there. So I made my way to Silicon Valley by way of Stanford Business School. Um, so went there and, you know, it was, you know, after a bit of time getting acclimatized, I kind of thought about what's the next thing I'm going to do? What's the next startup? So, um, you know, I ended up starting a company called Trulia, um, which while I was at school and then grew that for a decade um, through ups and downs, happy to get into that. And then, and then you know, about five years ago, that merged with Zillow and um, to, build, to create the world's largest online real estate company. And then, and then shifted gears to become an investor with NFX and James and Gigi and Morgan. How, how similar and different were the first for were last minute and truly in terms of the experience? Were there lessons that you could take from the first one to the second? Or were they, because they're in different internet eras, um, they were not as, uh, not so much overlap? Um, so many, um, so many, I mean, more things are similar than, um, than different. So, um, you know, I guess many different areas. So one was, um, you know, maybe, maybe let's talk about what's different. So at the time in, um, in Europe, the, you know, the challenges were like the internet adoption was small, um, but growing quickly. Um, two is the fragmentation of the market. It's like we had to launch offices and deal with local compliance and, you know, like restrictions and employment law and all the rest of it in like UK and France and Germany and Spain and Italy, all these different like um, places, which was um, just incredibly painful. And so like, so we were constrained by um, size of the market and then the fragmentation of the market. Whereas in the US it's like, okay, we had like, you know, five people in a room and we were like nationwide. It was phenomenal, a massive market and without the kind of headaches of implementing stuff. Um, two is just the cost to get going, you know, in 198 versus 2005, like, you know, you kind of needed a million dollars just to get a website going. Whereas like it just 10 grand. Um, and today it's like, it's like, you know, $10, um, to get a, to get a website going. So it's just dramatic kind of like lower barriers to entry. Um, those were kind of like just some of the sort of the bigger differences in terms of Europe versus the US. Um, what was very similar about, you know, and this was kind of bred from, I guess, part of why went into the, the online real estate world was, was, um, and, I, and I kind of think about this as a, as a, as a sort of general philosophy for startups. Like for, for me, it, it had to pass the, like the, the dinner table conversation, you know, remember those days, like <laughs> where I could sit next to someone and talk about my job to a stranger, like talk about my job for 10 minutes or more. And they would be as excited as I would be excited about it. Cause, cause the realization is that you're going to spend 10 years of your life doing this. And if you're not excited about it and you can't get other people excited about it, then you really are not going to kind of do the marathon that is going to be a startup. Um, and, uh, you know, both with travel, like when you're working hard, it's like, you know, you can, you know, there's good days and bad days, but every single day you're sending people on vacation. You're sending people to see loved ones. Like it's terrific. And the same with real estate. It's like, you know, you're, there are good days and bad days, but you know, you're helping to enable people's dreams, their lives, where they stay, where they sleep, their memories. And so, and that's, um, you know, that was really important to me. It doesn't need to be consumer businesses only, but something that you just are so passionate about and interested in um, that you can be excited about. It was just a fundamental component of it. The, the, the other sort of, the other thing kind of more retrospectively was that um, 
both those companies went through uh, incredible crises. Um, so in, you know, think of an online travel company in 2001, you know, first, you know, particularly after September the 11th. And, you know, once at the time when we were there, once we sort of digested the human tragedy of, um, of that event, you're like, well, our business is putting people on planes and putting people on, on vacation. And, and, you know, that completely decimated the business for a period of time. Um, but what happened after a few months, which, um, you know, it's was sort of surprising in retrospect was that the market came back in an incredible way. And in the sense that suppliers needed you more than ever because they're looking to sell seats on airplanes they're trying to sell um, hotel rooms. And of course, demand was down, but so it really shifted an industry from being an offline travel agent industry to being, okay, last minute deals, this is, you know, bargain hunters are looking for these opportunities and it was a clearing house for, for the industry. And the same thing happened in real estate in the US. So it, so if you think of 2008, 2009, like, you know, the global financial crisis was really precipitated by the US housing market. And so we were just in the eye of the storm and, you know, we made our money by helping um, consumers buy and sell real estate. Um, and the, you know, once, you know, the demand came down, but really the, the real benefit was helping suppliers to shift their inventory online in a big way and help cons consumers who were uncertain and confused and scared to, to navigate the housing market. And so, you know, while there were incredibly challenging times, it forced a level of efficiency and focus that was phenomenal. And we came out of it with sort of, with incredible market share, um, which, you know, and I'm sure here we are in um, COVID times, like same thing is happening all over again, just differently. You, you're talking about really liking something to pick the, pick the startup idea. What other criteria did you use to pick both of those markets? Because they ended up being both huge markets with uh, lots of day-to-day uh, -day activities. How did you think about it? You know, both of them were sort of large pre-existing markets. And so I think the, you know, certainly maybe we're, we're truly are the, the sort of observation. And I, I kind of break this, break this down into sort of three different areas. So like one is just the, uh, and I think about this around the startup timing. So one is like, what is the technology catalyst um, that's enabling this opportunity? So, you know, the technology catalyst, um, at the time for for Trulia in 2005 was one is just sort of broadband penetration was becoming sort of ubiquitous and so people were wanted you know a sort of a, a rich visual experience with mapping um, that they could move with videos with photos like they wanted a multimedia experience which was really only possible at that time and then two there was a rise of kind of structured data. And today we think about that as APIs and it's sort of like taken for granted. But back then it was just the rise of sort of certain kind of data formats that were being shared between different organizations. And so um, those, I think, were that sort of clear technology enablement. Um, the other piece is sort of a, um, a cultural adoption, which... Um, to do with startup timing. So what is the phenomena that's enabling this? And, and we've seen that, you know, I, I would say sort of cultural societal adoption, we've seen that kind of front and center today um, with COVID is just like working from home, Zoom meetings. It's like, that's exploded that that opportunity. And, um, you know, what, what we'd seen at the sort of tail end of this is um, the, the, uh, it's sort of not in the tail end, but in, in 2005 area that we'd seen just this massive rise of the consumer um, searches for, for real estate online. So it's like it was, there was a significant amount of consumer adoption, but there wasn't a consumer destination. And so and consumers were feeling distrustful of working directly with real estate agents. They really wanted a consumer friend to help to navigate the service for them, much in the same way that they wanted to um, work with a travel agent. I kind of akin this to like 
turning around the street screen and consumer empowerment. They, people wanted to be empowered by the information. They weren't getting access to it. And then the, the last piece is, which was not true in 2005, but was true in 2008, is the sort of economic imperative. Um, and so what, what had happened was that, you know, that the real estate industry was spending more and more and more in newspapers, but getting less and less as a result as their distribution was failing um, and they were increasing prices. And they were forced suddenly to kind of rethink their P&Ls, um, how they're spending money. And, and so real estate agents were like looking for kind of like cost efficient alternatives. And so there was an economic imperative for, for them to adopt the, the platform. So I, I think, you know, just to generalize in the start of a time, it does come down to those three things. What is the technology catalyst? What is the um, cultural catalyst? And then what is the economic imperative? And if those three, you don't need all three, but if those three align, then there's a terrific startup opportunity against the backdrop, you know, hopefully of, of a big market. And did you, how, how deep did you go into that analysis before starting Trulia? Um, or did you just say, okay, check, check, check. These are, I can tell, I can see it's there. Or did you do, and do you recommend to startup founders who are thinking about it? How deep should they be going to really check off those boxes? Uh, I think it was more sort of intuitive than it was analytical, to be honest. I think I'd, um, you know, I because if you're, and I think, you know, a little bit, it's this balance between being too early and too late. Too late is a problem, um, as well as being too early is a problem. But too early is sort of, it's a solvable problem in the sense you just need to kind of keep on working at it until the time is right. Being too late is just often just like you're banging your head against a wall that is like, is, is never going to break. So, um, or your head is going to break. So you're, so I, so I kind of think it's like, it, it just felt right. There's like, and there's, you know, I often think about businesses as, as like an element of like inevitability, like this should exist. Um, this makes so much sense. And you can often see that. Um, and then it's around, you know, as a as a founder being kind of thoughtful about what is the evolution of that journey um and kind of how are you going to sort of like efficiently kind of get there um you know and you know the obvious thing is kind of netflix is like may maybe you know today you think about okay streaming you know new 20 years ago you could have said okay let's it does make sense to like not just stream things from the internet and just watch them on your laptop or, or phone or, or tv it's like make total sense but there was for them, whether it was premeditated or not, but it, it's, there was this kind of natural sequence of drafting from an existing technology to be in a good place for when new technology comes out. You, you, you do need to kind of sequence those, um, those stages effectively. And that's what we look for in startup founders where they can be this category, category defining company. If they could do that day one, then great. Um, but more often than not, then it's like, you know, they can build a, you know, a remarkable business day one and then go on to become a hundred billion dollar category defining business through kind of constant reshaping of the market. And probably going through a lot of adversity as well, like you did in your two companies. What, what did you learn from those two, uh, you know, September 11th and a financial crisis? And how do you, what advice do you give to founders when Maybe it's not going well enough or something outside of their control happens and there's, there's not much they can do about it. Oh, so much. Um, you know, I, I guess I, um, so, so many things to think about. I, you know, I, I think just from a personal perspective, um, you know, I, I, I was not the CEO in um, at lastbin.com, but I was, you know, part of the senior management team and part of the founding team. And so I, I kind of seen it from kind of first hand and that gave me just a remarkable level of um you know i don't know whether it's confidence but just gave me before hardiness maybe another way but like it just gave me a sense that things are going to be okay um in 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 real estate and uh, in 2008 so um you know i and that, and that was just a helpful kind of like case study to share with, with the team. 
um, in 2008 when things were, were very challenging. I, I guess I, you know, the, the way that, you know, in dealing with these sort of crises, particularly sort of economic crises like this, um, you know, the, the way that we were, we were kind of thinking about it was one is just really thinking about how do you um, face reality? You know, that re when there's a changing situation, not kind of sugarcoat it, not put it under the carpet, but to actually just like face it front on. Um, you know, and most times that if you're in an early stage startup, so like share it with the team, bring more brain power to the problem, just accept the new reality of the situation, whether it's like you've lost team members or is a new competitor or there's or there's um, an economic change or a customer loss, just like just face it kind of head on, accept the new reality um, uh, rather than put your head into the sand. Um, the, you know, the, the next piece is really about, you know, it's the, the Churchill quote, which is, um, I'm going to get this wrong, but it's, um, uh, ne never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, how do you turn this as an opportunity? Um, and that is both energizing for the team as well as just the right thing to do. And so often in, in kind of, you know, you're in, in, in the sort of business world, you're, you're the David and there's a Goliath. Um, and the David can win by just executing faster. And we use a phrase where anyone can beat a grandmaster at chess. If you move two moves for the other person's mm -hmm. one, just moving, moving super fast and gaining ground and shifting to where the market is, not where it was. And, you know, it's, it's, it's um, always surprising how slowly big, big incumbents, the big companies move. So if you can be a fast, nimble market, it's fast, nimble company that's shifting to where the market is going. Um, and it, you know, in these times of crisis, it can be changing incredibly quickly. Then you can put yourself in a, in a very, very strong position. And the third, the third piece is really um, managing your and the team's psychology. Um, so much of this is a mental struggle, not a kind of like a uh, intellectual struggle or a business struggle. It's a, it's a mental struggle. Um, and, you know, in times of sort of challenge, change in times of uncertainty, um, you know, building a strong culture, building a strong community, having a clear sense of direction, having a good mission that you're going to, you, 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 you want to be working 80 hours a week um, is, is paramount. So, so managing psychology and just, you know, looking after yourself, being healthy, being happy, celebrating small wins um, is, um, is absolutely necessary. And, and I, I think that's, it's clearer today to folks because I think there's a lot more talked about these days, but, um, you know, managing, managing psychology is an absolutely necessary ingredient of long-term startup success. So switching gears a little bit to Latin America, you yeah. got involved in, in LATAM, uh, a few years ago with, uh, La House. And how did you decide to do LATAM? What made you make the jump? I think earlier than many of the other VC funds that are now starting to come more to the region. Well, I guess, you know, my, you know, a couple of thoughts. So one is that I, I'd been an advisor to Brian Rickworth from um, Viva Real Latitude um, uh, since the very early days. So he kind of reached out and hung out and um, 